As I look around and I see all the works your hands have made, all the awesomeness of you, and how your love will never fade. Mere words cannot express what I feel inside. I can't describe your glory divine, but as a token of my love, this is what I'll do. I'll lift my hands and cry, Lord, you're holy. Lord, you're holy, and we lift you up and magnify your name. Lord, you're holy. can say to tell you how much I appreciate all the wonderful things you've given me, your loving kindness, your tender mercies.
Amen. Omnipotent, omnipresent, soon coming King. Alpha Omega, Lord of everything. Amen. That's who He is. Children, you're heading off to Children's Church to learn more about Him. And we're taking God's Word to open it and hear that God speak to us this morning. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles. This week we're in Matthew chapter 16. Hopefully you've been meditating on these scripture cards, these memory verses. It's something you and I can do all throughout the week. We can prepare our hearts so that the, the, the soil is ready to receive this word. Meditating on this scripture and, and just turning it over week by throughout the weeks. And if you haven't gotten your box of cards, we've got plenty. Pick one up. And just have it there on your dining room table. And when you're stopping and eating breakfast or a dinner meal, just take some moment. Take a minute. Feed on the Word of God. It saturates and nourishes our minds. And that's what transforms us and renews us and teaches us these wonderful truths. Even that the choir just sang about, about who our God is. And we want to know who He is because you become like the object you worship. And so you got to make sure you're worshiping the one true God. And His desire is that we... Be like him. Well, I hope you found Matthew 16. We're going to stand even now ahead of time and read this section of scripture in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 28. And I want to dive right in because it's a very important section this morning. So if you will, just stand with me and honor the word of the Lord. I'm going to start reading, actually, get a running start here in verse 21. And then we'll look particularly at verses 24 to the end of the chapter. But hear what Jesus said and what uh, Matthew records for us that day when he was with his disciples. He said, from that time, verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Father, one day we are going to see our soon coming king. Teach us today to live accordingly. With an expectation at any moment that trumpet could sound. And Christ could snatch us away. Father, thank you Lord that what we are living for now will ultimately be rewarded. So Father, make sure we're living for the right things today. Spirit of God, speak to us today, Lord, if we are out of your will, Lord, if we are rebelling against your will, God, if we are disobedient to your will, Father, please speak to our hearts so that we can experience your grace, your mercy, and we can be cleansed and walk in newness of life. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, right every day in between. A day of a heart that wants to serve you, we pray. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. You notice that the section we're going to cover in verse 24 begins with a then. And a then means there's a when, there's a timeline, there's something happening. And we need to know and understand the context behind what Jesus says here. What happens in the preceding verses, if you go all the way back up to verse 13 with the first when here, you see in this timeline, Matthew is recording for us the 
uh, activities of Jesus and his disciples and something that happened when Jesus posed a very important question to them. And he posed that to you and me as well. Who do men say that I am? How you answer that question, how I answer that question, makes the difference actually between heaven and hell. Everybody has to make this choice. Who is Jesus? And everyone has to choose whether they want to go to heaven or hell. Now, if you had to pick this morning, which would you pick? Heaven. Amen. I want to go to heaven. Well, there's only one way to heaven. And that way is through the one way, the truth and the life. That is Jesus Christ. And if you and I want to choose heaven, then we've got to choose Jesus as our Messiah, as our Savior. When they gave the various answers, the the various interpretations of people, that how they perceived Jesus. It was Peter who said, listen, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, of course, said, Peter, you're absolutely right. And and upon that rock, I'm going to build my church. It's it's that confession that the Father just inspired you to speak. And and, and when he declares that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, he doesn't understand what that means. Because then in verse 21... Jesus began to explain from that time, he began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, uh, even to be killed and to be raised on the third day. And, and when Peter heard that, he took Jesus aside and said, now hold up a second. That, that's not part of the plan. He, he rebuked the Lord in some ways. He, he, he chided him and, and, and he pulled him aside privately and said, Lord, this is not what this is about. Because you see, they had a misconception of what the Messiah was. And when Peter expresses, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus now explains what that means for him to be the Messiah. That he has to suffer, he has to die, he has to give his life. But, but he says, listen, I'm going to be killed, but also I'm going to be raised again. The problem is what Peter thinks about the Messiah is not what Jesus explains about the Messiah. And when those two things don't match up, you're going to have a problem. You have a problem today, people have a problem today with their definition of who Christ is and what he requires of us. You know, Jesus says to Peter, of course, get behind my back. Uh, That's not what I'm about. Uh, Get behind me, Satan. Satan had already tried to derail Jesus from doing what the Messiah had to do, what the Father had sent him to do. And and what Peter was saying was essentially what, what Satan had tempted Jesus with in the desert, with those temptations to listen, say, listen, I'll give you all these kingdoms. They they can all be yours. Just just bend the knee. Just bow before me. And of course, it was there that that Jesus reminded Satan, listen, worship God. That's who we worship. And I'm going to do what the Father has called me to do. But too often, we're like Peter. We want to define Jesus in our own terms. We want a Jesus that we can manage. We want a Jesus, yes, that provides for us and protects us and ultimately preserves us. But we don't want this Jesus. Because this Jesus has a requirement for us. You answer the first question, do I want heaven or do I want hell? Everybody's going to say, oh, I want heaven. But you cannot divorce the cross from the Christ. And that's the problem with Christianity today. Because the second question is not a matter of heaven or hell. It becomes once you've chosen heaven, then it becomes in a daily walk, will I choose heaven or will I choose earth? Will I be tied to this earth or will I loose my grip on it that I might gain all that he has promised for me and live for heaven? And what Jesus is going to explain as one of his disciples is that to embrace the Christ, we must embrace the cross. We must embrace the cross on a daily basis. We must embrace, listen, not just that Jesus died on a cross for me, paid the penalty for my sins, purchased my pardon so that I can be saved. Praise God he did that. Praise God through repentance and faith we can be redeemed. But those who profess that have to embrace the cross, not just at the altar, but every day, Jesus is going to say, our responsibility is to choose heaven over earth. To pick up the cross 
and to follow him daily. And before we'll do that, you have to make this decision. Will I deny myself? Will I die to self? Because when Jesus reveals his identity, the amazing thing of what it required of the Messiah, that he must go and do the will of his Father, which meant going and handing himself over to those, the religious leaders, the religious authorities, where they would kill him. Well, first they would shame him. They would, they would uh, uh, re- uh, have, excuse me, they would suffer many things. Then he would be killed and then he would raise, rise again. In order to embrace that, Do you and I think that we would embrace anything different than what our Savior embraced? No, it's like Peter would say when he's writing his epistle. Listen, he's already gone before us. He's walked before us. A lot of people think, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Well, he showed us what he would do. He died for you and for me. He gave up himself. He emptied himself and took on the form, not just of man, but the form of a servant and a servant who would give his life as a ransom for many. Now the words that we're going to read here in verse 24, these words really, uh, they, 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 they shatter this vision of Christianity that so many have embraced, that, that we can merely profess Christ and then live as we please. That's not biblical. Not, not someone who has confessed that I've died to self to find life in Christ. And Jesus says in no uncertain terms, listen, if you're going to be one of my followers, if you're going to profess to be a disciple of mine and follow after me, then this is what? This is the paradigm. This is the way you and I live. Listen, not just for an hour on Sunday morning. This is how we live throughout the week because of what Christ has done for you and for me. The cost of discipleship is not cheap. But frankly, we have cheapened it in our day. Every time Jesus had a large following and they were coming because they wanted to see the miracles, they wanted to see people healed. But the moment he began to preach and teach and explain to them the cost of discipleship and what it meant, you know what happened to the crowds? They left. And it's here when when Peter has made this profession and identified him as the Messiah and Jesus explains what that means and says that means you must embrace a cross and then explained about discipleship. It's then that he called all of them. If you look at the other passages of Scripture in Mark and Luke, you see that it wasn't just to the disciples he spoke to. He spoke to the crowds as well. This is what it means to follow me. There's a pattern. Do you see it? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, I underline these terms, deny, take up, and follow, because it's a decision. He's not going to force you nor force me to come after him, but oh, he invites us to. He gives you and I every reason to follow after him. They had followed after him. Immediately, when you see the call of Jesus as those fishermen were there by the sea, immediately, Mark would tell us, they got up and they left. They left their nets. They left their father. They left their families. And they followed him. They left their occupations. They left everything that meant something in their life to follow this Messiah. Now, they didn't know at that time. It's here that Peter makes the great confession in this chapter. But but they were following this one, listening to him, astonished by what he was teaching, astonished by what he was able to do. And as they began to follow him, they followed him as, as many people will easily do. But then the rub comes in when he says, this is what it means to come after me. What does it mean? It means deny yourself. Die to yourself. Completely disown. Utterly separate everything that you are. Everything that you have. Everything that we possess. Give up everything to follow him. This isn't just self-denial. I'll deprive myself of a couple things and, and be a follower of Christ. It is complete abandonment. You know, right now, some people, um, you've heard some people, maybe they're talking about Lent. What are you giving up for Lent? What are you giving up for Lent? What are you giving up for Lent? And it's a period of time where, where, where some think you give up something as we head to Easter in just a couple weeks, right? 
and, and you give up those things and, and, because I'm following Christ. Now, this isn't just for a period of time. This isn't just for a short period on the calendar heading up to Easter. This is, this is the way we live. Jesus is talking about giving up everything for him. It's far more intense than just a, just a, a time period for, for 40 days where we give up some one thing for the sake of Jesus. That's not the picture he's presenting here. When I truly deny myself, when I deny who I am, it is a desire. You notice this verse in verse 24. He's going to repeat it down in verse 25. If anyone desires this today to follow Jesus, this is your will, what you long for, what you desire above all things, then here's the path. You have to understand, you have to deny your Self. And when I truly deny myself, it's not my will, but it's thy will be done. I die to my wants. I die to my wishes. I die to my purposes. I die to all that I am. I deny myself. I deny. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? That is what we are to do. Now, see, here's the hard thing. We live in a day, in an age, that promotes self. It is the greatest idolatry of the day. It is the idolatry of self. And it's crept, I don't think it's crept into the church. I think it's flooded into the church as well today. And into our lives. And sometimes we don't just realize how much we promote self. How much we are about ourselves. How much we want to lift up ourselves. Jesus says you can't do that if you're my follower. I've already said, listen, you're to love God supremely and love God those made in his image. We're not to love the things of the world. If anyone has the love of the world in him, the love of the Father's not in him, John would say. But this is the greatest danger that we would love ourselves more than we love God. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple... If you're going to come after me, if you desire that, then, then deny yourself. And this is the problem with Christianity today. We promote self. How many people come into worship and, and, and they, they want to be built up? In fact, that's what will happen in the end times, right? They, they want ear ticklers, TED talkers, those that will promote the self, build them up. Beloved, if we're dying to self, we're denying self, we're dying to self, we're going to look at that even more next week in Galatians 2.20. When we do that, we are saying, I'm dead. I'm dying to myself. I am denying myself. And the way we do it is what he says next, by taking up his cross. The cross that you and I have to bear. Every single one of us follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, here's the sad thing. See, this is the problem today. We have so misconstrued this teaching that we, listen, we will wear, and don't, if you're wearing one today, it's okay. Don't take it off right now. But we will wear golden crosses, silver crosses. For some, it's a decoration, right? There's my cross, right? And, and we don't understand that in that day, when Jesus said that, the people who were in the crowd that day and heard that understood, wait a second, you know what he's saying? He's saying... Pick up the instrument of death and carry it with you. Now, when you and I put a cross on and we wear that, we don't think that's the instrument of death always, do we? We don't. We don't realize the significance of what that cross means. We don't bear that with us. But this is what he said. You take up your cross. You begin your death march. You remember when Jesus had to rock down the Via del Rosa, right? They gave him his cross to bear. He began walking with that cross. And of course, he couldn't carry it. Someone else carried it for him. They get, Come here, carry this. And he took him to the place Golgotha, the place of the skull. And it was there when they laid him down and began to nail him to that cross. We don't think about, well, I'm wearing my cross today. We don't think about that. In fact, we have cheapened the cross in so many ways because what is an instrument of suffering and shame and humiliation? Listen, the, the Romans had perfected this. It was torture. It was torture when they, when they hung on that cross. We, we don't think about that when we put that cross on. But that's what Jesus carried. 
You see, we have this misconception. You know, we think, you know what, my burdens are my cross to bear. My, 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 my illness, my physical sickness, my handicap, uh, my, my, my wayward child, my, my spouse who won't believe. This is the cross that, that we have to bear. That, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that you and I willingly bear the shame, the reproach, the humiliation, the suffering, all the hatred that is against Christ. We willingly embrace all of that in our identity with him. We have cheapened it. Do you understand? This is the narrow way of life. What it means to follow Christ means it costs us something. The problem today is that the world doesn't see that difference. And when we are just like them and embrace them and call them and say, Come on, it's easy to follow Christ. We're not giving them the true gospel. We're not telling them the truth. Most people aren't willing to carry the cross today. They're not willing. Listen, when we identify with Christ, that means we're not going to compromise who he is, what he teaches in his word. We're going to toe the line and say, this is what God's word says. We're not going to compromise and capitulate and give into this culture. And so many have done that today. Unwilling to avoid the, the humiliation that the world might thrust at us and throw at us because we're, well, we're one of them Bible thumpers. We believe what Jesus says. You see, it, when, when you're standing with him, you, you might be humiliated because you take the stand that isn't part of the, well, the broad way where everybody is, is believing. You're not politically correct because you identify with Christ. Man, this affects, listen, the way you and I work, our work ethic. It affects how we shepherd our children. It affects the commitments that we make throughout the week. It affects every aspect of our life because this is, again, something that we have done. Daily, we deny ourselves and pick up this cross and we begin to carry it. And where do we carry it? In the footsteps of Jesus. We follow Him. We go, praise God, he goes before us. He says, follow me. Beloved, where he's going to lead us ultimately is to his throne. So it's worth embracing the cross that one day we might receive a crown. That's what he did. True discipleship is the willingness for you and for me to lay down ourselves and our rights to ourselves, our desires, our wants, all that you want, and say, no, I want what he wants. Remember, it was Jesus who said, Father, he set the pattern for us. Not my will, but thy will be done. Or as the psalmist says over in Psalm 46, Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, listen, that behold, it's written in the scroll, I delight to do thy will. Your law is written on my heart. You see, when he says to follow me, the picture isn't, listen, well, I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross, and, and follow you for about an hour of the week. Now, this is a lifestyle. This is the way we choose to live. It is the desire. I circle that in these, both of these verses because that's, that's what I need to understand. Is this what I long for and want above all things? I want heaven. But more than heaven, I want Christ. And I cling to him and I pick up that cross and I follow wherever he leads you can't just follow him to church on Sunday and then take a different path on Monday this is where we go every day and that's what the Lord is asking of you and me and requiring of you and me now why would we do this why would we die to self? Well, he's, he gives us this paradox in verse 25. Now, notice this. this. This doesn't make sense. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, if you want to lose something... You're, you're probably not going to find it. But he says, no, no, that's how this works. This is God's economy. This is how this works in your life and my life. It seems contradictory, but it's, it's true. The, the way you save your life is you lose it. And you have a choice. 
We have many choices every single day. I have the choice that I can live my life as I see fit or I can choose to live my life as God sees fit. I can do what he says. Yeah, I can refuse him. I can do what I want to do. But if I want to find my life, I need to lose it. But if I think that I can save my life, then I'm going to lose it in the process. And this is the paradox we all have to understand this morning. This is the dilemma that we face in all of the choices that we make. It's either his will or my will. But wait, wait, wait. See, this is the problem. It's either my will or thy will. And if it's thy will, then then you and I are on the cross dying to ourselves. Denying ourselves. All of our rights. Surrendering that to him. This is the commitment Christ calls us to. If you believe something other than that, if if someone didn't give you the full gospel and help you understand this, this is what it means to come after Christ. And the amazing thing is, hey, if you really want to save your life, heaven versus hell, then you embrace this because you realize this is what it means. I'm going to live for heaven, not for this earth. If I want to find my life, i got to lose it. i got to let go of it. Uh, so many of us are holding on so tightly to the things of this world, thinking, oh, yes, yes, yes. But the amazing thing is, is at the end of the way, if I will choose this way, then, then Jesus has a reward for us. He, he's going to reward us for this. Think about it for just a moment. If you and I possess the whole world, what profit would that be for us? Well, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? I mean, imagine that. You and I gain everything that this world has to offer. And beloved, we spend our lives just to get a portion of it, right? Think about how we spill, spend our time, our energy, our resources, all throughout the week that we might just get a little bit of it. And he says, wait, wait, what if someone got all of it? And then in the end, lost their soul. Would it be worth it? I, I, I mean, listen, if, if I said to you, listen, I'll give you everything. How about just for your little pinky? I'll give you all the power, all the possessions, all the, all the money. I'll give you all those things. Like, like you'd be like one of those rich, 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 rich billionaires, right? Seemingly have everything. And a yacht, you can go fishing whenever you want, go to any, any, uh, any vacation you want. You'd own the islands, right? That your vacation house will be on. All you got to do is give me your pinky. You know, there's people that would do that. But what if we said, no, no, it costs a little bit more. How about you have to give me your hand? Eh, some people might be willing to do that. Well, what if I was willing to just, just one whole arm? Would it be worth it? Take it to the end. Your whole soul. Would it be worth it? No, of course not. It wouldn't be worth it. In fact, Jesus told a story about a man who who experienced such a fate, right? He lived his life. He had a lap of luxury. Man, I'm so wealthy. I'm so rich. Look at all my soul has gained. Soul, you've done good for yourself. He went to bed that night. He woke up where? In hell. No! What has happened? Father Abraham, go back. Warn my brothers. Tell them, don't do this. Could I just get a little bit of water, please? To quench my thirst. How many live their life that way, trying to profit and gain what this world has to offer, and in the end, lose everything? Because this world has nothing to offer us. That's why, listen, if you have the love of the world in you, as John would say, the love of the Father is not in you. Beloved, don't become so attached to the things of this world that you cling to it and you hold on to it and you can't let go and say, God, whatever you want. Now, I'm not saying possessions are bad. I'm not saying vacations are bad. I'm not saying vacation houses are bad. I'm not saying it. I'm saying if that's what you and I are desiring and possessing and doing everything we can to acquire, apart from the Father's will, something's wrong. And we need to repent and say, God, these pursuits, they are vanity. They are vain. They, 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 the vanity of vanities, all the things we chase after and try to acquire. And this stuff will not be here, beloved. One day we're going somewhere. You've got to be ready. Well, what profit is it? In fact, let's just do a little economy here. What, what, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? 
I mean, I mean, if we were to barter for this and, and say, you know what, how, much, how valuable is a soul? You know what, I know how valuable a precious little baby is. Go, go over to a, a, a NICU, right? And see those precious little ones and how much we spend to keep one that's born 22 weeks, right, alive. And think about how valuable that precious little baby is. And yet we're talking about not a body that lives for however many years God's written in a book. We're talking about our soul that lasts eternal. Forever and ever. Think about that. What is the value of that? I mean, your soul is a value. Do you realize that all of us, you know what things are valuable? If they're unique, right? If there's only one of those things, they're incredibly valuable. I look in this room, you know what? All of us are unique. Made in the image of God. God, God, God made every single one in this room unique. Even if you're a twin, you're still unique. And, you know, things that last a long time are pretty valuable, aren't they? Usually. Well, if something lasts eternally, man, that's got a lot. You know, in other words, it's not going to break down and I'm going to need version 13 or 14 or iPhone 17 or 18. No. The soul lasts forever. Think about how valuable it is. Think about the image that it's made in. It's made in the image of the glorious God. The value you and I have. I mean, we're a little lower than the angels, but we're higher than all the created order, right? He's made us this way. And being made in his image, he gives us a uniqueness to be redeemed, unlike the angels. Amazing. The value of my soul, your soul. What, what can you trade for it? What can you barter for it? What, what can you exchange for it? Nothing. It's so valuable. You realize what it cost for you and I to enter heaven is that Jesus, that Messiah, as he describes himself, had to come and suffer and die to pay the price to ransom our souls. He paid the cost for you and for me. What do we think we could really give in exchange for our soul? Nothing. Nothing. You see, this is why this commitment is important for us today. To realize I need to die to myself. I have to deny myself. Uh, this is a daily decision, taking up that cross, realizing, you know what, it's more than the cross I wear, it, it's the cross I bear. A daily decision to die to my selfish wants and desires. But that's what it means to be a living sacrifice, as Paul would say over in Romans chapter 12. Is what Paul would say, listen, that in, in Philippians chapter uh, 3, that I might embrace the sufferings of the cross in my following Christ. And the fullness of the resurrection and the power that comes from my identity with him. This dying and finding new life in Christ. It's exactly what Jesus is saying in this principle, the conditions of discipleship, what it requires from you and from me, and what we must be willing to embrace. And why do we do it? Not just because he commanded it. Not because he just gave us the pattern to follow it. Not, not because we've considered what the, the cost is. But stop, also think there's a reward ultimately. You see, one day the Son of Man will come. He's coming. In the glory of His Father. And with His angels. And then He, I underline this in my Bible, will reward each according to His works. I wrote in the margin of a Bible, Revelation twenty two twelve. It's one of my favorite verses, right? Because Jesus says, you know what? Behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is in my hand to give to everyone according to his works. The great sermon one day was, hey, there's a payday someday. Someday we're all going to get our payday for what we've done, our works. The choice you and I have made. Hey, listen, we heard who Jesus is. Did we embrace him or did we say, no, no, I don't want that Jesus? Did I embrace Jesus as the Messiah, the one that God sent to pay the penalty for my sin, to die on the cross for you and for me, and to purchase our pardon? Did I embrace him? And did I embrace the cross that he bore for me? Is that the way I live my life? Because one day there's a payday. And we as believers will stand before the Bema Seat of Christ. We'll study that later in our study of the doctrine of godliness. We will stand before the Bema Seat and be rewarded for the things we have done by faith in the flesh for the glory of God. But if you're not a believer, 
there's a judgment coming as well for you. There's a great white throne judgment. The book of Revelation tells us. There's a great white throne judgment. In fact, there will be some who will stand there, as Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and they'll say, Lord, look at all the things we did. He'll say, you know what? Depart from me. I never knew you. Why? You didn't want to do the Father's will. You desired to do your will. It's scary to stop and think. Beloved, listen, one of the greatest testimonies of my faith and your faith, that it's real, is that it's not just a, a momentary thing. You know, in the, in, in the box of cards, every now and then, there's, there's the verse for the week. And, and then I, I added these little quotes every now and then so we can think about what some other godly people who've gone before us have thought about too as we meditate on these scriptures. Five words from Charles Spurgeon. Listen to this. Periodical godliness is perpetual hypocrisy. Periodical godliness is perpetual hypocrisy. Beloved, we don't get to turn it off and turn it on. Following Christ is not something, well, let's just flip the switch for about an hour and a half on Sunday and then flip it off. No, no, he's saying if you're going to follow him, deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow him daily. This, this is what it is real, Christianity. This is what he's calling you and I to. And if we're honest, too often we're into this periodical godliness routine. And if we really want to be salt and light in this culture in this day and age, beloved, this is our opportunity. No, my faith's real. And my faith is fleshed out. Do we get it perfect every time? No, absolutely not. That's why I run to that cross. I say, God, have mercy on me. There's a cross. There's a Savior who hung for me, who died for me. I plead that blood. Wash me. Cleanse me. Praise God if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we keep going in our sinful ways? No. No. I need to pick that cross back up. You see, there's only two pathways in life. There's You deny yourself or you live for yourself. You take up your cross or you ignore the cross. You follow Christ in his footsteps the way he's leading you or you go follow the world. You can't go both ways. If I lose my life for his sake, I'll actually find it. But if I try to save my life for my own sake, I'll lose it. You, we've turned our back on the world. This world has nothing to offer us. We, we've embraced Christ. I don't want to gain the world. I've turned away from it. I want to gain him. You know, everybody wants heaven. Do you realize... The center of heaven is Christ. Our pursuit, listen, isn't just I want heaven. No, no, no. I want the God who is in heaven. That's what I want. One day, if that's my heart's desire, praise God, there'll be a reward for my faith. Our faith will be validated and vindicated, and one day we'll stand in his glorious presence. We'll behold those angels, we'll behold him, and we'll be like him. Love the invitation days just to do that, to follow him. Now, it takes a lot to be honest with yourself today to answer those questions. Heaven or hell, and then heaven or earth. What am I living for? Both questions, answers should be heaven. Amen? But let's be honest. Sometimes we're in that periodical, periodical godliness routine. And I'm saying there's mercy today. Man, why not receive it? Why not say, no, Lord, forgive me. I, I want to be real. I want to be authentic, and I want my faith to matter. That's when we humble ourselves now and say, God, I've heard you speak. Now I need to do my part, which is repent and believe. The amazing thing is, right now, God's hand reaches to us. It's a nail-scarred hand. He's paid the penalty that our sin deserves, and praise God, he offers us grace. Will you embrace it today? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. As we're honest with ourselves today, are, are we surrendering ourselves to Christ? Are we pursuing that cross, dying every day as we've denied ourselves? It's an invitation today to... To come and embrace Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And realize today, I need a Savior to save me from my sins. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Then come embrace the one who died for you. And bore the penalty that your sin deserved.
Maybe you've done that as a believer. But you know what? You've not been living every day pursuing Him. Maybe you're just caught up in the things of this world, trying to gain them. You know, the, there's a reason why at the end of the service we open up the altar. Man, God, that's me. God, convict me. I don't want to continue that way. I want my passions, my desires, my affections to be for Christ, for Him alone. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're being honest. Search your heart this morning. Is that the desire? Have I understood the call to follow Christ? If anyone wants to come after Him, am I doing that today? Am I denying myself? Am I taking up the cross? Am I following Him? That may mean we need to let go of things of this world. We need to let go of some of our pursuits because you know what? They're taking us actually away from Him and not to Him. And if you do that today, He'll actually give you something far better as you walk by faith and trust Him.